Hello, what is happening in our cities? That is the pulse of America tonight. We've reported on this before, but it bears repeating. At least 12 major U.S. cities have set homicide records this year with three weeks to go. Two others, Milwaukee and Minneapolis, are close to becoming numbers 14, uh, 13 and 14. But if you listen to two big city district attorneys, the people whose job it is to prosecute crimes, there's nothing to see here. First, Philadelphia, the district attorney, Larry Krasner, recently came under fire for saying there's not a crisis of violence in the city. Basically, we don't have a crisis of lawlessness. We don't have a crisis of crime. We don't have a crisis of violence. Now, that drew the ire of former Philadelphia Mayor Michael Nutter, a fellow Democrat who, in an op-ed in the Philadelphia Inquirer, said in part, quote, I have to wonder what kind of messed up world of white wokeness Krasner is living in to have so little regard for human lives lost, many of them black and brown, while he advances his own national profile as a progressive district attorney. Now, here are the latest numbers for Philly for this calendar year. 524 homicides as of early December. That's an all-time high, passing the previous record from 31 years ago. 2,161 individuals have been shot. That's a 3% jump compared to the same time last year, according to police. Now, Krasner did try to clarify his comments in a follow-up statement, but partially blames the media while doing it. Quote, I know that some inarticulate things I said have offended people. The message conveyed through media sound bites is not at all what I meant. Complete answers based on data aimed at solutions to gun violence will be edited down to sound bites. It's my job to make sure even those sound bites are careful. All right, that's Philly. Now, Los Angeles. George Gascon, the DA whose progressive policies have him facing a possible recall, held what amounts to a victory lap news conference, touting the changes he's made to the way the office files cases, seeks bail, and also pursues charges. When asked if his policies have led to the rise in crime, he said this. Well, actually, none. Uh, I know you hear a lot of uh, a lot of misinformation uh, concerning the this uh, particular um, wave of crime. Uh, number one, actually, most crime is down. Homicides are up roughly 46 percent in Los Angeles as of the end of November. Car thefts up 53 percent. Now, to be fair, property crime is down 6.6% under Gascon, and those are the types of crimes many experts link to his policies. So there's that. But we're talking about violent crime, and in both cities, the DA says, remain calm, all is well. Sort of reminded us of the final scene in Animal House, where Kevin Bacon's character says the same thing to a riotous mob moments before they trample him. Obviously not a laughing matter in a lot of cities, but there appears to be a disconnect between perception and reality. For more on this tonight, we begin with Detective Jamie McBride. He's the head of the LA Police Officers Union. Uh, Jamie, it's great to have you. Uh, I saw where you said, we can't guarantee your safety. Uh, and and what, what it reminded me of was almost like a State Department travel advisory in a war zone. Is it that bad? It, it is. You know, I'm, I'm telling everybody, um, if they're planning to come to Los Angeles uh, for, for the holidays or to visit somebody, please don't. Um, it is so violent right now. We haven't seen homicides like this since the 1990s. Um, we can't guarantee your safety. And, and so I'd rather have you stay home. I hate saying that because I feel for the small business owners, um, but I, my, my priority is your safety. Uh, I tell everybody it's like comparing it to the movie Purge, but instead of 24 hours to commit your crimes, you have 365 days under George Gascon. Um, people are literally getting arrested and released almost faster and sometimes faster than the officers can complete the reports. And that's a fact. Um, you know, George Gascon said yesterday at his press conference that the criminal justice system failed the suspect that murdered Jacqueline Avant, meaning that if there's more opportunities of programs for him in his prior arrest, this could have been avoided. He is delusional. I mean, if you look at some of the, uh, the notorious murderers in Los Angeles, like Richard Ramirez, known as the Night Stalker, I don't think there's any program that he could have benefited from uh, that would have kept us safe. The, the, the reality is there's evil out there, and that evil needs to be um, incarcerated. Um, you know, under George Gascon, he thinks it's all about programs. Now, one last thing he said was uh, property crimes down. Um, there's a lot of people that are living in fear and don't want to call the police to report their crimes. In fact, we have uh, victims calling in 
to some of our stations in fear, saying that the person that assaulted them the day before is already out and walking in their neighborhood. Mm. That's how fast they're getting released. We mentioned the recall effort against the uh, the DA there. He says there's no link between his policies and what he called the perception that crime is rising. I mean, if, if it's not his policies, what is it that's leading to this? Because the numbers don't lie. As we mentioned, homicides are up almost 50%. Well, let's look how we got there first, right? So, um, you know, George Gascon, um, years ago, um, authored Proposition 47, which changed sentencing guidelines. Um, and so we have these so-called soft on crime district attorneys. Now, if you take the two major cities in California who practice this soft on crime uh, approach, it's San Francisco with, with their DA uh, Bodine and it's George Gascon. And the crime in both cities are just crazy. It's like a war zone. It's almost like when you see these two and their policies, it's like you're watching a sequel to Dumb and Dumber because everything they do does not make sense. Well, you can tout successes with low-level drug crimes and misdemeanors, which I guess they have done, and it has worked in some respect in some of these. But people are worried about you know, the major crimes, including homicide, and to your point, feeling safe. Why do you think this is happening, Detective? I, I mean... Uh, there has to be a reason that all of this is up beyond, to your point, that people are getting out quicker after being arrested on other things. Are there other, do you think, factors involved here? Well, there's a lot. I mean, a lot of it goes right back to, to George Gascon's policies. And one thing he said uh, yesterday in his press conference was the reason why there's more violent crimes is because there's more guns out there. Almost saying that he's advocating for, for some kind of gun reform. But what he's not saying is part of his no bail policy is if you're in possession of a firearm, you don't stay in jail, you get released. And when I worked the streets, I used to have to chase gang members that were armed over fences and everything to catch them. I'm talking to our officers today, and they're saying that gang members are, aren't even running. Then, and when they ask them, how come you don't run? You have a gun. They said, well, we're not gonna go to jail. And just look at some of the crimes that are happening. You have uh, somebody throwing a Christmas party in their backyard, and what happens? You have two armed suspects go back there and rob everybody that's in there. Just the other day, we had a 12-year-old boy shot and killed. His mother was wounded, and another girl that was nine years old mm -hmm. got shot in the back. And you know, one minute, this kid's excited about Christmas is coming around the corner. The mother's planning on what to buy her, her son, and now she's planning, instead of buying gifts, she's planning a funeral. Yeah. George Gascon needs to wake up. And, and in my opinion, he's just as responsible as pulling that trigger as the people that did it. All right, uh, Jamie, thank you very much. Jamie McBride, he is the head of the L.A. Police Officers Union. I know you're down a lot of officers as well in L.A. We appreciate you joining us tonight to give us some perspective. Thanks for the time. Thank we you. want to talk a little bit thank more you. now about another thing. We actually wanted to get Jamie on, but we're going to bring in our friend Heatha Herzog to talk more about this. Smashing grabs impacting the economy. Retail analyst uh, Heatha Herzog is here now. So, Heatha, what are you hearing from retailers? Because I saw where some of the big box stores are now asking Congress for help, trying to at least make it harder to resell stolen merchandise. Retailers are echoing exactly what Detective McBride is saying, which is there's a lot of fear there. And you know, the retailers are really bifurcated in the sense that you have the big box retailers where you're seeing a lot of the smash and grab, but you also have these small businesses that are extremely afraid. Mm -hmm. So according to Catalyst Research, we have about 79% of small businesses that have physical present stores. So they have a, a lot of different channels of how they sell their items, online, wholesale, online, you know, websites and physical stores. And those physical stores are really under siege. Um, Detective McBride, again, noted Proposition 47. Um, where it's significant here is that it has lowered the threshold of what is considered um, a, um, a, 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 a misdemeanor. So if you steal something that is under $950, it's no longer a felony. It's a misdemeanor. So these people that are going out there it's, grabbing things yeah. and selling it online, it's, it's suddenly not as it, the stakes aren't as high certainly a crime of opportunity it appears Heath, but i want to get your reaction to something the chicago mayor lori lightfoot said about this um hinting that retailers weren't maybe doing enough to stop it here's what she said we still have retailers that won't institute um, plans like having security officers in their stores, making sure um, that they've got cameras that are actually operational, um, uh, locking up uh, their merchandise at night, chaining high-end bags. These purses seem to be something um, that is attracting a lot of attention on these organized retail uh, theft units. Not to mention attracting shoppers. That's why they're there, Heatha. But uh, retailers say she's misinformed. And I guess two points that stood out to me is that these stores, a lot of them do have security. 
and they also have cameras because we're seeing the video. You know, I come from a perspective of where I report the facts, and I just have to say here that she is wrong. Retailers are really stepping up their game when it comes to protecting their stores. I mean, no one wants to get ripped off. No right. one wants their stuff to be stolen, especially these retailers, high end, big box, small business. No one wants that. And I've been covering this for 13 years. Retailers have always, always protected their stuff. So, uh, you know, where this attrition she thinks is happening. I mean, sure, we've ha we've seen that in the retail industry. Security guards may be harder to come by just because right. We're seeing this across all industries, but retailers have always taken measures to protect their merchandise. Retail analyst at H Squared Research, Heatha Herzog, great to have you with us tonight. Thank you. Actor Jussie Smollett's defense attorney says they will be appealing the actor's guilty verdicts following the conclusion of the trial. The actor found guilty of falsifying a police report and staging a fake hate crime against himself. Smollett maintains his innocence, his attorneys vowing to appeal. Smollett's lawyer appeared on Morning in America the next day, and here's what he told News Nation. The jury's verdict is inconsistent. You cannot say for the same incident, we find him guilty uh, for lying, but not guilty for lying about reporting the same thing he reported. Uh, and so, you know, that's what I would say. I respect the ju judiciary. I respect the jury system in this country that we have. Uh, but sometimes juries get it wrong, and, and that's our position. This is sort of a palm uh, forehead incident, I think, here of Lakai. Uh, she joins us now, Lakai Vincent who is the Democratic strategist and also an attorney. I thought this was over last night, Lakai. Apparently it isn't. I mean, they're welcome to appeal, but where does this end? So as a criminal defense attorney, Joe, it does not end until it ends. You certainly want to put up a good fight for your client. If they are convicted and you feel like there is any opportunity to file an appeal, you will absolutely do so. But notwithstanding that fact, it doesn't end for Jesse Smollett. He has some civil cases out there, one mm -hmm. with the city of Chicago and the other involving the brothers who are suing Jesse Smollett for the comments that he made and the statements that he made regarding the brothers and their alleged attack. So yeah. unfortunately for Jesse Smollett, this is nowhere near the end. Good point. Yeah, I mean, the city of Chicago is trying to recoup the money it spent on the investigation. Look, I, let me ask you, if you were representing Jesse Smollett, would you advise him to fess up, admit what happened and apologize, or at least accept the verdict. And then maybe he gets probation now because it seems like a lot of people feel like the judge could make an example out of him. What, what do you think is gonna happen with sentencing? So Joe, there's no question that the judge could make an example out of him. It's clear that there was a personal vendetta by the judge that decided to assign a special prosecutor. And when I say a personal vendetta, not meaning that she has something personal against Jesse Smollett, but she doesn't want any actor, actress, or anybody otherwise of celebrity status making a mockery out of the criminal justice system. So they want to make sure that they make an example out of him. And I think they did just that. But in terms of what happens after this, I think it's unlikely that he will get any jail time, just considering mm. the fact that this was not a violent crime. There's no victim. And on top of it, this is his first time being convicted of a serious felony, a class four felony. So I think it's unlikely that he'll get any jail time, but certainly a fine and some community service. But we never know, because like you said, Joe, the court may just try and make an example out of him yet again. All right, Lakai Vincent, it's always great to have your voice on the legal issues. Thanks for the time. Enjoy the weekend. Thank you, Joe. You too. More countries joining the U.S. in its diplomatic boycott of the Beijing Olympics. We'll ask Senator Ron Johnson next if he agrees with that and if we should send our athletes at all. I'll also ask him about comments he made about using mouthwash to help fight COVID. It's getting a lot of attention online. Could he actually have a point? That's ahead. More countries joining the U.S. in a diplomatic boycott of China's Beijing Winter Games coming up in February. Now, Australia, Canada, the U.K., Lithuania have also chosen to send no diplomatic officials to Beijing. New Zealand is also following suit, but says for a range of factors. The Chinese Communist Party newspaper responding this way. To be honest, Chinese are relieved to hear the news because the fewer U.S. officials come the fewer viruses will be brought in.
Senator Ron Johnson, Republican of Wisconsin, joins us now. Uh, ouch, Senator. Uh, it, it doesn't sound like they're offended, I guess. Let's start with this boycott. Um, do you think we should send our athletes? Yeah, it's a pretty tough decision when you've got athletes that have trained for years for that particular moment. I, I hate to use uh, athletes in, in diplomacy that way. I think it's entirely appropriate that we shouldn't be sending any, any U.S. representatives. I think companies are going to have to decide to what extent they want to participate. Um, and, and, and American consumers will probably be paying attention to, to which companies are trying to make money off uh, the Beijing Olympics. So. Uh, but but for the athletes themselves, I, I would just hate to deny them that. Right. So you're you're good. You're okay with the diplomatic boycott then? Oh, absolutely. With something, you know, I I absolutely agree with the Biden administration. There aren't many things I do agree with them on. <laughs> you know, we we, we, should, we, sh we shouldn't be rewarding their bad behavior. It's it's very unfortunate the turn uh, in terms of uh, you know how how China is is uh, threatening. Uh, Taiwan and, and, and its other aggressive actions. Right. I, I know there are others in the Republican Party, though, who don't think it goes far enough. And I was thinking about it today, Senator, and we didn't even boycott the, the 36 games in, in Nazi Germany. And I thought, too, about, I mean, there was a lot of talk of that. And they said the same thing you just did, you know, that the Olympics should, should really be for the athletes, not the politicians. But 1980 is the other one that we've talked about before a lot. And was that right to, to boycott Moscow after their invasion of Afghanistan? And looking back 40 years, do you think it made a difference? Was it worth it? Again, it's hard. These these are tough calls. Um, and so I kind of leave it up to the individual athletes. I leave it up to the uh, individual companies that are going over there. But, you know, from a government standpoint, we absolutely should not. Yeah, there are things you're doing in Congress, though, as I understand it. In fact, the Senate passed a package uh, back in July, as I understand, that would restrict certain products coming from China based on where they were manufactured. Where does that stand? Because that's something the Senate could do. Well, and I support that as well. Uh, we, we need to be very concerned about the, the slave labor camps, uh, the Chinese uh, crushing of human rights. Uh, that, that That is something we can... Uh, provide some discipline to through our trade uh, policies. All right, let's talk about uh, one of your efforts in Wisconsin, which as we know, and I don't need to tell you, is a key state come election time. Where do you stand on your effort to try to have the legislature take over federal elections instead of the, the bipartisan election agency that's there now? Or is this really not going anywhere as long as Governor Evers is in office, a Democrat? First, to understand the bipartisan election commission is bipartisan in name. Yes, there are three Democrat, three uh, Republican commissioners, mm -hmm. uh, but when when they're tied and they're almost always tied, uh, and then it falls to the very liberal Democrat staff, and so the, they're issuing guidances that are contrary to state law. We had a legislative audit bureau that uh, points this out. I think 30 different recommendations. Uh, there's some real, there were real irregularities, some real problems in how the election was administered in 2020. And so I've called on the state legislature to reassert its constitutional authority over federal elections and to just basically disavow the Wisconsin Election Commission. But the goal, the goal should be something every Wisconsinite should share. We have to restore confidence our election system, that this is unsustainable, where in 2016, you know, the Democrats didn't view it as a legitimate result. Now 2020, the other half of the country is not viewing this as a legitimate result. This is unsustainable. So we need to restore confidence that your legitimate vote isn't canceled by a fraudulent one. That means following the law in Wisconsin, which the Wisconsin Election Commission did not do, and also, we might have to enact additional controls, particularly over absentee ballots, where the Carter-Baker Commission uh, said was probably the greatest uh, opportunity for election fraud is in, in, in absentee ballots, which we doubled hmm. while we relaxed all the controls in 2020. Does it restore confidence, Senator, if one party's running it, no matter, I mean, whether it's Republicans or Democrats? Well, again, no, you follow the law. And that's what the Wisconsin Election Commission was not doing. So we've had longstanding law. For example, in Wisconsin, it's a right to vote. It's a privilege to vote absentee, which which means you have to follow the rules. You have to apply, provide voter ID, a signature on file. You have to get it in on time. Those are reasonable rules if you want to uh, take advantage of absentee balloting. 
Um, so again, it's, it's just about reasonable controls like voter ID that, uh, by the way, most Americans agree with voter ID, even though that's been very controversial from the Democrats. Right. It just seems like Democrats want to make it easy to cheat. Republicans want to make it easy to vote, but they want to make sure that only legitimate votes are cast and counted. Um, let's talk about your comment on COVID, using mouthwash to treat uh, COVID. It's getting a lot of attention. Uh, what I saw you said was, why not try all of these things? Um, is there an amendment you want to make to that? Because I, I did see a doctor at NYU who said, you know what, it might not hurt if accompanied by the vaccination. Would you agree with that? Well, listen, all I was doing on a telephone town hall was telling Wisconsinites, because I monitor this daily, that we are experiencing surge, a dangerous surge. COVID's a dangerous and deadly disease. So take it seriously. So do everything you can, you know, to boost your immunity system. There are things you can do. And there's actually a study on the NIH website that says using common uh, mouthwash can reduce the viral load in your mouth. So why not do all of these things? Vitamin D, zinc, vitamins, there's no danger to these things. Uh, so again, it's completely taken out of context. Uh, it's, it's meant to imply that I'm saying substitute mouthwash for vaccines. I never said that. That's what, those are words that people are trying to put in my mouth. This is, a, this is taken to a level of absurdity, just trying to attack me because they want this U.S. Senate seat. Uh, speaking of which, the last time you and I talked, you weren't ready to make an announcement. You want to make some news? Are you running again? Uh, still evaluating it. <laughs> well, I'm still trying. All right, Senator Ron Johnson, thank you for the time. We appreciate it. Merry Christmas. Same to you. So a footnote now on the senator's point about mouthwash. He did cite the NIH studies, and there are multiple studies that say certain mouthwashes do indeed reduce COVID viral loads. In one specifically about viral load reduction with mouthwash use, that's right in the study's title, it says, in conclusion, mouthwash resulted in significant reductions of COVID viral load in saliva up to 60 minutes after rinsing. For its part, Listerine says its mouthwash is not intended to prevent or treat COVID-19. Another member of Congress with a gun-toting Christmas card. Is this the best way to show support for the Second Amendment? We'll discuss that ahead. And parents so badly behaving at youth sporting events, referees are quitting. Oh, man, this is hard to watch. We're going to talk about it. Is a kid's soccer game, for crying out loud, We'll get into that just ahead. U.S. Representative Lauren Boebert coming under fire for a controversial Christmas tweet. The Colorado Republican recently tweeted this picture showing her four boys holding guns around a Christmas tree. You might remember Representative Thomas Massey criticized for posting a similar photo of his family last week with each of them holding guns as well. Now, Democrats are already calling for Boebert to be disciplined for her repeated anti-Muslim comments about Congresswoman Ilhan Omar. Robbie Suave, senior editor of Reason Magazine, back with us again. Robbie, it's good to have you. So Merry Christmas and welcome to the gun show. <laughs> Merry Christmas to you as well. Yes, I will not be including uh, guns in my uh, holiday card, but I am a supporter of the Second, Second Amendment, so people, you know, can do right. as they see fit. Is this the right way to do it, Robbie? But I mean, we know we, we had the timing no. with the Michigan shooting, and, uh, and AOC tweeted uh, afterwards, which kind of makes you wonder if this is part of what this is all about. But she said, basically, you know, what does any of this have to do with the birth of Jesus? I mean, is this at this point, is it more for shock value and, and just the kind of response and reaction that we're talking about? That's exactly what it is. And, and again, I am a full supporter of Second Amendment, Second Amendment rights. Right. I believe people have the right to own to own guns. I think what they're doing in these Christmas cards is sort of, and it's funny, the right criticizes the left for doing this for the term virtue signaling, when you're kind of obnoxiously wrapped up in your own politics and you need to let everybody know. They say that the liberals are doing that. Well, this is kind of like the conservative version of that. I, I don't think it's contributing to, to violence or anything like that, but it, it's a way of like inflaming people, making them mad that, that, I, that I would not choose, that I don't think it's a good look. You know, a, a gun, it can be something important and fundamental, without being something that is, is sort of glamorized and just put into the hands of children just as props. So that would be kind of how I would criticize it. You know, a gun is a, is, a, is a dangerous thing. It should be used responsibly, and we should teach our kids about gun safety. I don't know that that means that, that this is 
nearly the same as that. In fact, I, I don't think it's the same as right. that. All right. Now let's talk about a survey, Robbie, we wanted to get you on. Uh, that, that talk to college kids and, and young Democrats in particular for this first part that we want to talk about. Where students, 37 percent of Democrats said they wouldn't be friends with a Republican. And 5 percent of Republicans said that the other way. So I think to your point, here in lies, we've talked about this, some of the problem with politics today. That, that number is actually kind of sad and troubling, isn't it? Yeah, honestly, I was surprised it was even that high. <laughs> I, I would have expected uh, liberal college students to be even less willing to be friends with a Republican. You know, our society has improved in a lot of ways. Uh, ra attitudes toward other races have improved. You know, look at uh, how people poll on the issue of, for instance, interracial marriage. It's, it's, it's you know, way higher. It's, uh, hardly anyone is against it today. That wasn't true 20, 30, 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have become more hostile to members of the other political political party. We, we have a greater prejudice against people with a D next to your name if you're an R, R, D. And, and certainly on college campuses, there is a kind of, you know, the militant woke, if you want to use that derisively person who just, you know, thinks everyone who isn't as left as them, even though they're a, they're a super minority of, of society, uh, is, you know, is, is irredeemably broken. And I, I don't think that's a healthy way to view your fellow citizen, even if you strongly disagree with them on policies. Well, there's more to the poll, too. There were 71% of Democrats who said that they wouldn't go on a date with someone who voted for the opposing presidential candidate. That was 31% for Republicans on that side. This one I understand a little bit more, right, Robbie? I mean, sickness, health, and, and politics. <laughs> yeah, that's what it, that's what it is. Maybe uh, maybe y young Republicans uh, need to need to be a little piped down about some of their views when they go on dates. I have I have no idea. Um, I, you know, I'm as as far from those days as one can be. But right, uh, so. but it, you know, it does show show the hostility that that is in the that has bled through our politics into yeah. kind of just broader relationships no that doubt I, that it is is not that is not ideal you're a libertarian and i know you're married robbie but uh if you were single do you think a democrat would date you <laughs> that's a great question uh that i have no idea how to answer um i you know i have i do have friends on all sides of the political spectrum right. I'm, I'm in media i'm good friends with right-leaning journalists mm -hmm. left-leaning journalists mainstream journalists alternative journalists so i not to not not to g g represent myself on your show as someone everyone should be friends with but i <laughs> i do my best and sometimes i think libertarians are well positioned actually because we disagree and agree with some things on all different sides. Yeah. So sometimes uh, it, it, it's not that I'm a moderate, but I'm almost moderate in my temperament and my uh, sure. my ability for libertarians to get along with everybody. Well, that so 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 we, we we can be of some use, I think, to the yes. to the broader culture. I mean, the boyish good looks and the charm and the last name Suave. I mean, this is like a layup. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I think the answer is yes. We know that. Robbie Suave, it's always good uh, to have you, my friend. Enjoy the weekend. Thank you, you too. <laughs> Ball strikes and sucker punches. Americans out of control on more than airplanes these days at their kids' sports events as well. One frustrated veteran referee recently calling youth sports today a cauldron of yelling and hysteria. All of this leading to the Washington Post headline recently, sports parents are horrible and referees are finally doing something about it, quitting. Brian Barlow is a soccer referee and an activist against all those parents behaving badly. He posts videos online of unruly coaches, players, and parents on his Facebook page, Offside. He joins us now. Brian, it's great to have you. You see this every day with your Facebook page. How bad is it out there? You know, it's so bad. I was listening to the segment before your, yours, and you're talking about how you don't want to be friends with Democrats or Republicans. You know who I don't want to be friends with? Adults <laughs> who go to youth sporting events. Right. That's who I don't want to be friends with. But yes, to answer your question, I see a ton of videos and a ton of behavior that should not be acceptable at youth sporting events. It's really sad. And that's why you're doing something about it. I just, on a personal note, Brian, I wanted to have you on because this is near and dear to me. My dad refereed high school football for years. Bravo. Um, and, and I umpired softball games with him over the summer. So this definitely resonates with me. And, and we used to wonder, you know, if this continues like this, no one's going to want to ref. And that's what's happening. Well, I tell, you, I tell you what, you know, from a percentage standpoint, we are losing refs at the highest rate we have ever lost referees in any sport at any level. Once you get down below the professional level, it, refs are just sick of it. Listen, if it wasn't for referees, 
It would just simply be recess. You would be going to watch your kids play recess. <laughs> right. You need to learn to respect, love, admire your referees because they're quitting. And eventually, you're not going to have a game. You're going to have recess. So tell me more about these parents. You call them cheeseburgers. What's up with that? Yeah, I call them cheeseburgers because they're normally the people that spend more time in the line of the concession stand trying to figure out if they're going to have a hot dog or a cheeseburger or a Coke. They go to the field. They sit in the shade in their little comfortable chairs with their little blankets. Blankets, and then they decide they want to be an official. Mm. Now they're ready to be an official. So we called them. I couldn't call them the word that I really wanted to call them, uh, and I won't say it on, on your, <laughs> live on your TV. So I called them and deemed them cheeseburgers. They are cheeseburgers. We are trying to rid the world of cheeseburgers so we can give the game back to who it belongs to, and that is the children, the kids, the players, the athletes. Let them have their game. Let, let me ask you this, Joe. What if I told you I don't like the way that you give me the news? And I'm not going to, you know what? I'm going to go to your boss. I'm going to tell the boss that you suck. You're going to need Ooh. to get in line on that, Brian. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right? But that's what referees are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. And right. listen, you know, we're not getting rich being officials. Sure. We're not, we're, not, we're not becoming millionaires. And the younger officials, they're saying, you know what, keep that 50 60 70 80 dollars, shove it up your what-what, I ain't doing it anymore. <laughs> you know, this, this also resonates, Brian, because uh, our kids are grown, but, you know, back in the day, they were involved in all of the, you know, the travel sports and all that. And I think this is probably part of what happens is the parents get so involved they're so invested they're traveling all over the country and if I could go back and tell these parents now what I know it's like look none of these kids or very few of them are going to college to play anything they're, and they're not and they're not going pro for the most part you know relax and enjoy and just watch the game you know, you have an option whenever you get involved in youth sports. You have the option to be a coach. You have the option to be a spectator. You have the option to be a volunteer. And so our saying on the Facebook page is simply this. Whatever you choose to be, be that. But I can tell you this. You didn't choose to be an official because there's very few of us. Okay, mm -hmm. so be a spectator, be a coach, be a volunteer. But most importantly, get out of the way. Yeah. Give the game back to the kids. This is the other thing my dad used to always tell me, and, and, and I laugh about it because none of us, and, and, and I think I speak for, you know, except for, you know, what was the guy's name in the NBA who got caught, you know, fixing games, but none of these referees care who wins. I mean, you're just out there calling balls and strikes as you see it, you know, and the parents get, get just sideways as if, to your point, your wife made a great point about how you have to remind parents that the, the players are six and the referees 12. And listen, I'm in Orlando, Florida today. I'm watching my young uh, son, Eli, ref, and I hear someone say, uh, this is a bunch of home cooking. What they don't know is we traveled 1,600 miles to be in Orlando today to ref uh, a game. He did, and I can promise you, he doesn't know where the teams are from. He's not right. keeping track, and he doesn't really care. And quite frankly, no referees really care yeah. what team wins, especially in the youth level. It's just, at collegiate youth, it, it just doesn't matter. Hey, uh, that was a shot of my pops, but by the way, he was the white hat there. Man, he loved officiating, and he was all about it. And that's why we share the respect for what you're doing. And, and uh, Offside is the Facebook page. What's the web page, Brian? You know, it's, uh, we have OffsideAcademy.com, and the Facebook page is just simply Offside. And then we have this whole new program called RAT, which is a referee abuse tracker. It's a 1-888-544-REFS number that any time that a ref gets abused or you see a ref being abused or even assaulted and it happens, mm. uh, you can report that to that mm. number. And we have an, an entire right. legal team and people from all across the country involved in this network that uh, can track these people down and make sure that we make them public, we publicly shame them on the Facebook That's page to make sure, yeah, to make yeah. sure they don't do it again because it's, it's got to stop. It's ridiculous it the does. way adults are acting at youth sporting events and it's got to stop. And listen, I know I'm an official and we're not supposed to be out there and out front and all that kind of stuff. But I'm putting my best foot forward, and I'm right. saying, listen, enough is enough. Yeah. Brian Barlow, it's great to have you. Soccer referee and offside creator, we appreciate the time. Take Don't care. Don't be a cheeseburger, all right? All right. <laughs> Words to live by. It's the most wonderful time of the year, and U.S. lawmakers are filled with the Christmas spirit. Some Republican senators incorporated some holiday traditions in their speeches on the Senate floor while talking about the supply chain crisis. Iowa Senator Joni Ernst incorporated a, cra a classic Christmas hit. Mariah Carey's All I Want for Christmas is You. If, like Mariah, you don't want a lot for Christmas and don't care about the presents underneath the Christmas tree, this may be your year.
Senator Tim Scott put his own twist on how the Grinch stole Christmas, or as he called it, how Joe Biden stole Christmas. You see Anthony Fauci there as uh, Max the dog. Certainly sums up our political discourse, and it's our American snapshot. What is that stench? It's fantastic. <laughs> Leland's next. Have a great weekend. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.